you grew up in the Dallas area, if I recall correctly, right? And yeah. then you came to Stanford. So I think maybe we can start there. Um, yeah. When you came to Stanford, how did you figure out what you wanted to major in? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so maybe a, a good way to put this in context is to talk about why I wanted to go to Stanford in the first place. Mm, yeah. Because when I was in high school, um, Rahal, like, I don't know if you had this problem when you were when you were growing up in Michigan, but for me, I was always kind of oscillating back and forth between um, like the humanities and science and engineering. So mm. when I went to school, for example, like the gifted and talented programs at my local public high school were all centered around the liberal arts and the humanities. So I took those classes and I really, really enjoyed them. But after a while, I thought that I wasn't getting a good math and science education. Mm. So then I switched schools and went to uh, really a math and science academy. It was called the Texas Academy of Math and Science. Right. And it was like a, it's a public charter school. Technically, I was living away from home for the last two years of high school, but it was fairly close to home. Um, and then after two years there, I felt like, okay, I'm not actually getting enough liberal arts, right? So when I was applying to colleges, I really wanted to go to a school that had the breadth that could satisfy any interest that I wanted. And Stanford felt to me like the, the optimal choice in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I mean, you know, when I tell my friends that, for example, I never applied to MIT, for example, or Caltech or Carnegie Mellon, they're really surprised because I ended up mm -hmm. doing a PhD in computer science. But at the time, I was very averse to going to a school that was strictly engineering. Or strictly. Mm. Go ahead. You were thinking that you would major in engineering or computer science, but that it was also important to you that in addition to a strong engineering program, it also had liberal arts. Well, technically, I wasn't even sure about that. So, uh, okay. um, but for example, like when I applied, I said I wanted to major in chemistry and international relations. And uh, the really funny thing is, I didn't take a single chemistry class. <laughs> and I took, I took, I think, one international relations class, and I wasn't a huge fan. And then I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put this off to the side. Um, it's pretty similar to me. Like when I was applying, I was like, I'm going to do physics for sure. I'm going like, to either physics or like something in that realm of like, you know, maybe something theoretical and electrical engineering. Right. I never took a single physics class. Like I did <laughs> science and it's like, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, I think also you and I joined, you and I came to Stanford right after the economic collapse in 08. Yeah, and that's true. That's exactly when computer science started to become super popular. Right? Like we were right at that inflection point. And so I remember when I got to Stanford, I actually switched from chemistry to physics, right? And I didn't mm -hmm. take any international relations classes until like the very end of freshman year. Um, and after a year of taking physics classes, I was actually like just kind of frustrated and I felt like I was at a dead end. And mm -hmm. so my sophomore year, fall quarter, I told myself, okay, I need to sort of cast a wider net again. I need to, you know, do a bread first search. Um, and so I took, uh, electrical engineering class, an economics class, a computer science class. I took one more physics class. Um, and I took the computer science class because my freshman year, I mean, you can testify to this, everyone was taking CS 106A. Yeah. Right? Everyone loved taking it with Mehran. They loved Jerry Kane. They loved Eric Roberts. And my roommate was doing it. He was having a blast building breakout. And I was, I was low key jealous, right? I really actually thought that this could be a lot of fun. I didn't do it because I had no exposure to computer science at my high school which is kind of ironic that I went to math and science school. You would expect mm -hmm. them to have computer science offerings, but they, they really didn't. Um, and none of my friends in high school did computer science either. Like all of my math and science friends, especially, they were all taking lots of math classes, right? And maybe some science classes, but it was more math than it was science. Yeah. Um, but man, I took, I took CIS-16A fall quarter sophomore year and I, I fell in love with it like immediately. Yeah. And I think the reason why I fell in love with it was because um, I talked about this earlier, right? How I was going back and forth between, you know, liberal arts versus sciences, right? I think computer science is one of the few domains where it really is both an art and a science. Um, mm. And so I felt like, okay, I finally found a domain that captured both parts of my brain, right? I remember actually like maybe the first week of class, Maron picked up the textbook and he said, this book is called The Art and Science of Java. Right. Now, why is it called the art of Java? That seems kind of weird, right? Because it's a computer science class. You wouldn't expect there to be an artistic element to computer science. Yeah. And then he told me something that really blew my mind, right? He told it to the whole class. He said, when we give out our first assignment next week, we're going to ask you to program Carol the Robot. We'll give you some very simple tasks, right? And there's roughly 400 students in this class. And assuming nobody cheats on this submission, everyone is going to have a unique submission for this assignment, even though the problems are super basic. To me, that didn't make any sense. I was like, but if the goal is just to like, you know, pick up a beeper and put it from one corner to the other, 
how like how many different ways could you do that? How many ways yeah. can you like <laughs> solve a simple task like that? It turns out that like you know writing a program is more like painting a painting right or mm -hmm. writing a novel even if you give someone a very very simple task like paint a house or you know write a short story of no more than a couple paragraphs um it turns out that everyone has their unique perspective and their sort of unique fingerprint when they yeah. develop that 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 solution because everyone everyone's mind works differently and to me that you know in a way that's kind of the definition of art right it's like each person's perspective on this is very very unique and you can give them a set of constraints, but how they decide to compose those constraints to build something new, that's a fundamentally creative process that no two humans can do the same. Yeah. That's also why in high school, I really enjoyed music. I played clarinet in the youth orchestra and music was this very scientific endeavor that was also, again, fundamentally creative. Hmm. Um, and to me, computer science was kind of a natural extension of that. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think that like it, sounds like computer science fit that bell of like marrying the artistic side and the scientific side. Um, also, like you mentioned the inflection point where like at this point, 2009, 2010, 11 is mm -hmm. really where computer science jobs started becoming really yeah. high paying and like everyone wanted that. I think mm -hmm. there's also a third component, right? Like I think you alluded to this as well, which is that Stanford did such a good job of teaching these intro yeah. classes, right? Like yeah, yeah. it was so popular because it was like cool to like be part of these intro classes and like building yeah. out these cool assignments, right? Yeah. So I wonder like how much of the teaching appealed to you like versus oh, like so much, teaching man. for like physics. Yeah. I, I don't remember the intro classes for like, I don't know, electrical engineering being that exciting. They were not, they were not at all. So I took the physics 60 series my freshman year. I met some awesome folks, by the way, in those classes. Yeah. Like these folks ended up becoming my really good friends. I met some like some really smart people in those classes. What's ironic is I saw all those people again in my computer science classes because okay. I think they like me realized, okay, I came here, I wanted to study something, something, you know, scientifically intense, right? And I'm gonna take the hardest physics classes at Stanford. I'm gonna like really master this. And then it turned out that because it wasn't super well taught, um, and it's not, it's no fault of, I think the department at Stanford, I think it's just that the computer science department at Stanford is so good at yeah. teaching and so good at, you know, taking these abstract concepts, making them very concrete, making them very accessible for students. Yeah. And the other aspect I think is that compared to a lot of other departments at Stanford and just across the country, like in other universities, I think Stanford has dedicated teaching faculty. Like these are people who are, they're not actually doing research necessarily at Stanford. Like their job is they're just amazing teachers and they teach these intro classes. And they also have the section leading program where they have like peers who help each other out. And I think that's pretty unique to, to Stanford. Exactly. Um, like Eric Roberts, Julie Zielinski, Maren Sahami, Jerry Kane, and Keith. Yeah. Those five people, I yeah, think, have changed so the lives of so many people in, in the Bay, like in the whole world, really, because... Yeah. Um, you know, they inspired so many folks to teach as well. They showed, it what, they showed us what it was like to, to really take computer science and make it teachable. And so I honestly give super, a ton of credit to them. So, yeah. so the, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but one of the things I wanted to get your thoughts on is you won later on when you were a grad student, you won the Centennial TA Award, the Teaching Assistant Award, which is basically for people who don't know, it's an award given at Stanford to a teaching assistant who demonstrates a lot of care and excellence in teaching and like mentoring students. So I'm wondering um, what class were you teaching where you got that? And like, what, how did it come to be? Like, what makes a good teacher in your mind? Oh, that's a great question. So first of all, I appreciate that a lot. It's really, it's really kind of you to say. Um, so I, I got the TA award. I think it was a combination of TA um, CS 142, which was the web applications class. And then also CS 145, which was the databases class. Um, and I think I give credit, first of all, to the professors who first taught me those courses. Um, you know, John Osterhout, who was my advisor, taught me CS142. And then Jennifer Widom taught me CS145. Uh, mm. the basis class. Um, I think what makes a really good teacher, honestly, is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Um, there are certain obvious ingredients, right? Like the ability to uh, explain things well, the ability to be patient, the ability to sort of frame things in different ways for different people. Yeah. Um, for folks who are visual thinkers versus auditory thinkers, you have to be able to sort of, you know, cater to their learning styles. But I think what it kind of fundamentally comes down to, Rahul, is you kind of have to be a people person, right? Mm. And actually, I give a lot of credit to the section leader program for kind of um, capturing this too, right? I remember, you know, when you and I applied for, to be a section leaders, right? In the interview process, they ask you, they ask you like, take a very simple concept in computer science, but explain it to someone 
who has no background in computer science and try to use some sort of analogy to make it relatable to that person, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and these are sort of long form essay type questions that aren't really easy to do. And the first time that you see them, you're like, wait a second, why am I, why am I explaining the concept of big O complexity to like a ballerina? I'm never gonna have to do this, right? right? But I think it's actually a phenomenal question. To be completely honest with you, I now use, <coughs> Excuse me. I use those questions when I interview software engineering candidates at Neotax. The yeah. very first question I ask them is, you know, explain some concept to your parents or your grandparents or your kids, because I want I want to see can they can they take do they know it really really well to the point where they can, you know, make it accessible to somebody else, right? Can they can they communicate well? Do they have the fundamentals down? Are they able to make the analogy correctly so that this person will truly get it, right? Yeah. And it, it, it sounds like that's, that is your job today, right? Like you talked earlier about how you are the translator in your company, like your, your whole job or like a majority of your job today is actually just doing this translation and explaining things so other people can understand. So I feel like it's super relevant. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I didn't think about that, but I think, I think you're spot on. Um, yeah, I mean like that skill, man, it's incredibly valuable. It is, yeah. it is unbelievably valuable. And I think it's very underrated, right? Because you're not gonna learn that skill in a particular class. But you will learn that skill if you're asked to, you know, TA a bunch of freshmen, for example. Yeah. And I give a ton of credit for, for the CS198 section leader program. That was one of the best decisions I made in undergrad. Yeah, I mean, the advice I give to everyone who I come across is like, if you're in a technical field, or even if you're not, it's like the ability to teach and being able to explain things will help the person who you're teaching, obviously. But you'll actually get more benefit yourself by teaching because you just learn so much in that process. Um, so I feel like, yeah, 100% agree with you.